Good evening and praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on Wednesday, January the 6th, 2021. This is our first Wednesday night Bible study of the year. And we say God bless you in Jesus name. And we are so glad that you have again joined us tonight. As we begin this particular online service, let me just remind everyone in our church family, as we are starting a new year, the importance of Bible reading being a part of our daily lives and how in just about 10 or 11 minutes a day, uh, you can read the whole Bible through throughout the course of the year just by giving 10 or 11 minutes a day. There are many Bible plans that are available online. You have the U version, you have Olive Tree, multiple Bible apps that you can download. There are some on YouTube that read the Bible aloud to you. There are literally thousands of programs online that can assist you. You can read the Bible in order as uh, the books of the Bible are arranged. You can get a Bible like one that I have that I got off of Amazon that I like a lot. It's actually in the New King James Version and it has the Bible in chronological order. I really like that one. Sometimes I will, and that's what I'm doing this year, I'm reading the Bible in reverse order. So I'm starting with the book of Revelation and I'm gonna go backwards. So however you choose to do it, I wanna encourage every member of our church to make a commitment in 2021 to read the Bible through uh, during this year. There are bread Bibles available as well on Amazon and other websites and uh, bookmarks and lists and uh, different ways to do it. One way that I have done it uh, as well that I enjoy is I have gone to BibleGateway.com and you subs can subscribe to a daily email that will come to you, your inbox at like five in the morning or whenever you want it to come. And it will have a reading for the day. And by reading those emails over the course of the year, you can read the entire Bible through. So I wanna encourage you to do that. It's very, very important to have the word of God hidden in our heart. Secondly, uh, we are announcing a week of fasting and prayer next week. And we'll start on Monday and go through Friday. And what I would like to ask our church family to do is to actually do a food fast, not a social media fast or just a chocolate fast or a soda fast, but a full food fast in which you only drink water and don't eat anything else. And I want to leave it up to you, whether you want to do five days, three days, or if you would just want to do one day, um, a fast that I would encourage you to do if you are not in the habit of fasting would be... Uh, for example, on Monday evening, if you were to eat dinner at 4.30 p.m. and you finish by 5 o'clock, start your fast at 5 o'clock on Monday and then fast until Tuesday at 5 p.m. for your full 24 hours and then eat dinner uh, on Tuesday evening. It's a little bit easier to start it that way if you're not in the habit of doing so. Another fast that is good is to simply fast every meal of the day up until dinner. Don't eat breakfast, don't eat lunch. Again, we don't want to legislate that. We just want to encourage you to choose that which you're able to do based on your medical history, your medication, your health, and so on and so forth. And our objective with this particular fast is that all of us in our church family would draw closer to God. So I really want to encourage us over the next 10 days that that would be the focus of our praying, that we would draw very close to God. So very, very important. I'm so happy to announce to you that we will have in-person church this coming Sunday, January the 10th, and we'll have church at 10 a.m. We will be following protocols, and so we're asking you to wear your mask. We're asking everyone to please not arrive until at least 9.45 a.m. And as you're coming in, please be cognizant of physical distancing and the fact that every other pew has been blocked off and please sit with your family. We'd encourage there to be no hugging and shaking hands and all of this business. We have hand sanitizer, hand washing stations and so on and so forth prepared here at the church. We'll be very strict about our dismissal and dismiss by family and by row and do our very best to be as safe as we can. I do wanna encourage you if you are healthy and you are not immunocompromised, I wanna encourage you to be here. Very, very important that we be in the house of the Lord. It's been two months since we've gathered together here in this precious sanctuary. And I must say that I miss seeing all of you. I miss worshiping with you. I miss singing with you. Well, I'm glad you joined us tonight. And I'm glad that in the 
midst of the challenges we've had in the last year, at least we have been able to connect online. If it would have been 10 years ago, I don't even think that Facebook Live videos existed. And so it had been very difficult for us. So I'm thankful that we had a means to stay in spiritual contact with each other through the course of this pandemic. And I say, God bless you in Jesus name. My prayer for you for the new year is that the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you and the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you grace and mercy and provision in this year in Jesus name. I'm gonna ask you to pray with me if you would. And then the praise team is gonna lead us in one song of worship before we begin our study. Lord, I am so thankful tonight that you have chosen to be such a good God, such a merciful God, such a kind friend, a, a friend that actually sticks closer than a brother. We honor you tonight, Lord, for you are the Lord and there is none beside you, none above you, Lord, none that can compare to you. Lord, bless our time of study tonight. Let it be a blessing and an inspiration and a help to our lives, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and let the church say, Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. We're so glad that you joined us online today. Help us worship the Lord. Oh 
Bible study, if you want to grab a cup of tea like I did and uh, kind of relax as we go through this, is going to be a little different than what I normally would do on a Bible study. Our normal Bible studies are uh, much more theological in nature, but tonight I want to talk about what I think is a very, very important subject and something that I feel that the Lord had put in my heart as a pastor to talk about, and that is I want to talk about the history of the Pentecostal movement here in North America over the last 120 years. And I think it's important to discuss this for several reasons, but the most important reason uh, that I want to discuss this with our church is that I want all of us to understand that this just did not happen. Pentecost, uh, this apostolic way, Bonneview Ministries, the United Pentecostal Church, the Pentecostals assemb uh, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, the Assemblies of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Assembly of God, the Holiness Movement, the Church of God, the Church of God in Christ, all of the various Pentecostal denominations and fellowships that exist in our country. And, and there are actually over 100 oneness Pentecostal organizations, and, and there may be more, but I was able to find 100 in my study uh, right here in North America. But but all of those groups, all of those branches, all of those different splits and denominations and, and groupings of, of Pentecostal believers, that didn't just happen. There was uh, something behind all of that. There was a reason that that happened. It didn't just happen by itself. There's a reason that now here in the year 2021, in the month of January, that we're still doing church now in the 76th year of just this local assembly, Bonneview Ministries. It didn't just happen. There was a great moving of God's power that produced this. And so that's one of the reasons why I want to call us to fasting and prayer next week is uh, we need God's power. We need the power of God to come in and move in our midst and do that which we are unable to do. I wish that I had the power to heal people. If I did, I would heal every person that I saw. I wish that I had the power to forgive sins. I would forgive everybody's sin. I wish that I had the power to stop violence and difficulty and the hurt and the pain that is happening in our world, but I don't have the power uh, to do that. But we know one that does have the power to do that, and that's the power of the Holy Ghost. And so tonight as we begin our study, I do want to begin in the Word of God. And I want to take a look from the writings of the prophet. And we call him the prophet of Pentecost, and his name is Joel. And in Hebrew, of course, they call him Joel, the prophet Joel. The Bible says this, Joel 2, verse 28. And these are the words of the Lord speaking to the prophet. The Lord says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And then the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. Aren't you glad to know the name of the Lord tonight? That whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and the remnant in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Those are the writings of Joel, the prophet of Pentecost. And he wrote these words many hundreds of years before the outpouring of the Holy Ghost at the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem that we read about in Acts chapter number two. And so I wanna read for you there in Acts chapter number two, we have the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that happened on the day of Pentecost. and. If you've heard me preach very often, and most of you have, you know that this is something we've referenced often. When that happened, a lot of crazy ideas came about as a result of this wonderful outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and people were very confused as to what was happening. 
And the Bible tells us that Peter, that one that had denied the Lord, not one time, not two times, but three times had denied the Lord, but the Lord restored him and allowed him to preach the first message of the brand new church in 33 AD. And this is what he said to them. It's a powerful, powerful verse and something that the Jews would have understood because they studied the writings of the prophet Joel. Here's what he said in Acts 2 and 16. He said, this is that, praise God, this is is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then Peter goes on to quote the prophet, what the prophet said. And when the prophet said it, he was just quoting the Lord. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad to know his name tonight? I'm so glad to know that. So I want to talk about um, the history of Pentecost and talk a little bit about revival here in the United States. And as you go back and study what we would call church history, and not just the history of our local assembly or the history of the West Virginia District or the United Pentecostal Church, but even go back before the existence of those entities, you'll find that the Lord had sent uh, preachers into the United States as far back as the 1600s, the 1700s, that were greatly used of God. Some of them Uh, had massive revivals, and a majority of their revivals led to massive repentance. It led to cities and towns and villages turning around. One such man, his name was Peter Cartwright, and he was born in Virginia and then ended up going to Kentucky. And in those days, it was during the days whenever Kentucky would have still been a frontier, and it was a very rough place where some very rough people lived. And the Bible or, or the history books of um, Christianity in the United States say, and I'll quote for you, that God blessed his revivals and thousands were stirred. Sometimes more than 100 people would repent in one meeting. He would preach four or five times a day. The revivals were noisy. People would fall on the floor as God's spirit rested on them. There was a powerful move of God Uh, after his preaching. There's another preacher that you've probably heard of. His name is Charles Finney, and he died in 1875. He was used of God. He would go to dead churches, and his preaching would stir them up. You know, I believe in preaching. Anybody out there believe in preaching? How can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach if they're not sent? The preaching of the Word of God, you know, the Word of God has creative power. When the Lord created the heavens and the earth, what did he do? He spoke the world into existence. Let there be light and boom, there it was. So the creative energy that created the heavens and the earth and the moon and the stars and and that life-giving flow that went into the nostrils of Adam, uh, that's the same power that goes into effect when we preach the word of God. And of course, Charles Finney, we don't know uh, the extent of his experience, whether he was filled with the Holy Ghost or not. Uh, we, I don't know. I know there's speculation. There are writings about it that you can see in his biography. But the history that I read about him, the, the part that I underlined here in my notes was that God especially used him to stir up dead churches and his messages renewed conviction, zeal, and joy. And so God had sent people into the frontier because God cares about people everywhere. Then there's another preacher you've probably heard of. His name is Dwight Moody, and he lived in the 1800s. He died in 1899. They called him a one-book man because of his devotion to the Bible. He was greatly used of God. There were many others, A.B. Simpson, um, a guy by the name of George Fox. You've probably heard of William Penn and Alexander Campbell and and William Miller, who is not as well known, but uh, he started the Adventist movement. And of course, they're still in existence today. And I thank God for every single preacher and every person that was used by God uh, to bring about a spiritual awakening. And every uh, 
preacher, every movement, whether it was the holiness movement or whether it was the circuit riding Methodist preachers of the late 1800s or whether it was the Pentecostal revival of the early 1900s, the Lord used many voices to bring the church and to bring the world to a place where apostolic ministry and the full counsel of God would be renewed. What am I talking about when I talk about apostolic ministry? I'm, I'm not talking about Bonnie View apostolic ministry per se. I'm talking about apostolic ministry from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And really when King James uh, had the Bible translated into this English version that we use today, and the translators called it the Acts of the Apostles, in my opinion, they really should have named it the Acts of God because it's what God was doing through them. I want to tell you something today that you may have a hard time believing. God wants to fulfill apostolic ministry in your life, and he wants to fulfill apostolic ministry in your family. And in your neighborhood, you have the power of God and the ability to pray for someone and then be changed and healed by the power of God. I really believe that. You have within uh, your spirit the ability to pray for your children and call down the fire of heaven uh, to fall upon them and to minister to them and to help them. And so it's so very, very important that we are cognizant, again, as I said at the beginning of this study, and that is that this did not just happen by accident. Just like John the Baptist and many others before him prepared the way for the arrival of the Messiah 2,021 years ago, the Lord also prepared the way for this modern day Pentecostal movement to take shape here in the United States. And so tonight on uh, this particular beginning of this lesson um, about Pentecostal revival, I'm, I'm starting in the year 1900. And I want to talk about 1900 up till now. And, and so it's important to recognize that Christianity and many churches existed here in the United States from the very beginning, from the time that the pilgrims came. Matter of fact, in the Northeast in Massachusetts at Plymouth Rock, it can't be but, I don't know, 75 feet from Plymouth Rock. I've been there and visited it. The first church building that was ever built in the United States, and it's still standing. It doesn't look like a cathedral we might build today, but it's a very humble building. And in that building, there is a rock. And on the rock, there is an engraving of a scripture that is a scripture very popular to us Pentecostals. And it is Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I think it's very significant that in the 1600s when the pilgrims started coming here and they erected a church and they took time. And in those days, there wasn't a, you know, they didn't have the printing available or the, the masonry work and the tools and the machinery that we have today to engrave on a rock. For example, the Ten Commandments that has been professionally done here on the corner of our church parking lot. And they painstakingly with effort and at great expense whenever they left behind uh, a piece of, of this, this rock with a scripture on it in their church so that generations following them would see what verse they thought was the most important verse. It wasn't John 3.16. It wasn't Genesis 1.1. It wasn't the last verse of the book of Revelation, even so I come quickly. No, it wasn't any of that. It was Acts 2.38. It was, it was repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost uh, that they put on that rock. And they did that on purpose. They had, that verse had to mean something to them. So I don't know about their experience, but I find it very interesting that that was the verse that they put up. And so churches existed and, and there were some denominations and movements that were present here in North America. But here's what happened. Many church people became very dissatisfied and they became very uneasy in the closing years of the 19th century. 
And so they saw that the professing church had become so formal, it had become so dry and so calloused and full of formalities and rites and traditions, and it had lost its power. And let's just be honest, I don't wanna go to a church that doesn't have power. I've been to churches where there was no power whatsoever. There was nothing happening. I do not wanna be a part of a church like that. If the Lord could speak the heavens and the earth into existence, if, if three Hebrew children get thrown into a fire and, and the king, who's not a believer, looks in and sees a fourth one and says he looks like the son of man and he doesn't have any, any uh, education at all about Judaism and yet he knows his spirit identifies that as the son of man, we're talking about a powerful God we serve. And I think we have the right to, to then believe God for his power to show up in our lives. And so they saw that the church had lost its power and there was worldliness and there was a lack of faith that was prevalent in that church, those early churches. And, and so what happened? Well, you go back and you can read the history. And I'm not talking about Bible history. I'm talking about American history. People began to pray for more spiritual food and for God to make a change in the churches and in their individual lives. Well, you know what? When you begin to pray and ask God to make a change in your individual life, in your family, in your city, in your community. You know what? That's why I want us to pray next week. That's why I want us to fast next week. I want us to collectively join together and get as close to Jesus as we can and ask God to change Kaiser, West Virginia and ask God to change Mineral County and ask God to change this region. I don't think that our time is up yet. I think the Lord could come at any moment, but we're still here. We're still here worshiping and preaching and praying. We might as well have the power of God up operating in our church and in our lives. And so uh, they, they didn't know what to pray for per se. These people didn't know what to pray for, but they recognized their need for special help. I, I kind of feel like that's where we are right now. You know, as a church, we've done everything we know to do. I know as a pastor, I've preached everything I know to preach. I've prayed every prayer I know to pray. Uh, I have sought God. I have asked God for help during the pandemic. I've asked God to protect our people. I've been seeking God every morning at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. I've been over here at the church at this altar multiple times per week, praying, talking to the Lord. I've done everything that I know to do. And I know many of you uh, have, have joined me in prayer and seeking God and asking God for help and done everything that you know to do. Uh, just like those people did 120 years ago, they recognized their need for special help. And so tonight in Bible study, God, we need special help. We need special help, a special provision, a special touch of the power of God in this city. And in this region, God, we need your power to show up just like you did, Lord, on Azusa Street and just like you did in Topeka, Kansas. And just like you did, Lord God, in all those early revivals, we need you, Lord, in Jesus name. I want you to believe the Lord with me, they needed special help. And so what happened? Well, 1900, there was a small group of Bible students and uh, their teacher, and they're at a very small Bible school in Topeka, Kansas. And they began to read in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And they talked about how the Lord had poured out the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And they believed, now you gotta get this, they not only read about it in Acts chapter number two, like I just read for you, they didn't just read it as information. It, it didn't just become knowledge in their brain that, okay, this is what verse 38 says. This is what verse 39 says. They read it and they believed it. And when they believed it, they asked God for it. And when they did that, God answered their prayer. I challenge someone tonight to read the word of God to believe the word of God and to believe God to pour out his spirit just according to the word of God. And so they read about how God poured out the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. They believed God would give them a similar experience. And so what did they do? They began to fast and they began to pray earnestly to the Lord. And so they met for a New Year's Eve watch night service. And you can read about this. There are multiple history books that are written. Matter of fact, uh, I have several of them and I actually had given some to Sister Debbie Boyard even just a couple weeks ago. She had been reading about it. There are several of them in existence 
and that, that tell the stories of, of these early days of Pentecost. So they met for a, a watch night service, they called it on New Year's Eve. And on the first day of a new century, guess what happened? And this is where we lose a lot of people among Christianity at large and denominational churches. And that is that this woman began to speak with tongues as evidence that God had given her the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to stop right there for a second and we'll continue on in a minute. This is where a lot of people get hung up. There are church denominations that teach that that particular activity, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, as the Spirit gives utterance, that that's of the devil. However, when you read the Word of God, when you read the book of Acts, and you see that the Holy Ghost was poured out, you see that this was an experience that early believers had. You go to the book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and, and it talks about the gifts of the Spirit that are in operation in what we would call Holy Ghost churches. And, and Paul talks about the proper exercise thereof, but nowhere ever in the word of God does it ever say that that particular manifestation is of the devil. Quite to the contrary, that manifestation is a manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost. And I would say to you, even if you are skeptical, that that's in the Bible. We're, I'm not talking about something that's not in the Bible. It's in the Bible. And I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge our church. You need to check for yourself and make sure that what I preach and teach to you comes from this Bible. Because, uh, you know, sometimes I might, I might teach something and say, all right, uh, this is not in the Bible per se, but this is my preference and what I think we ought to do. And I always like to categorize it as such. But there are things in the Word of God that have nothing to do with our preference. It's just the Word of God and we better do it regardless of the preference of our flesh. And so... This outpouring of the Holy Ghost was something they found in the Bible and it had been practically unheard of for 1,700 years. There's almost no mention of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And so later in that same meeting, there were others that began to speak in tongues as they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That throws people off as well. When we say Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, we're talking about the same entity. We're talking about the Spirit of the living God. And in that meeting then, not only were there was there the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and people spoke in tongues as they received the Holy Ghost, but there were also interpretations of the tongues that had been spoken, which is also something that's taught about in the Word of God. And those are the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit are given to the church. They are not given to the world. They are given to the church. And they are for the edification of the body of Christ. And that's one way that you can judge ministries. That's one way you can judge uh, the gifts of the Spirit. And that is really two things. Uh, does the ministry or the, the gift of the Spirit that is in operation, does it, number one, lift up the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, and number two, does it edify and help the church? Uh, if it doesn't lift up Jesus and if it doesn't help the church, then it's not of God and it has no place being part of the work of God. The Lord would never send the gifts of the Spirit in order to embarrass or harm or hurt or damage any single person. And of course, we've seen abuses of this. I see abuses of this right now. I saw a lot of it on Facebook uh, messages and sermons, especially at the new year. All of these, uh, I call them prophet liars that have all these prophecies and all these things they want to prophesy and talk about. And uh, I, gotta, I don't want to get on a, on a soapbox here, but if you want to hear from God, I want to encourage you not to seek a prophecy or an angelic visitation in the middle of the night. Open up this book and you'll hear from the Lord. Open up this book. This is the counsel of God. And so uh, they had this great move of God and they had interpretations of tongues. And, and so this particular outpouring that started in that Bible school starts to spread. And what happens is, is that the young lady, the first young lady that can receive the Holy Ghost, so she goes home, she tells her grandparents about it. Well, the one grandparent is, is closed off to it, uh, staunchly uh, conservative and formal in their religion. But another grandparent says, wow, show me this in the word of God. And so upon seeing it in the word of God has the experience 
And so it goes from granddaughter to grandmother, and then grandmother shares it with a neighbor, and then the neighbor shares, and the next thing you know, you have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, not just in Topeka, Kansas, but at the same time it's happening in Topeka, Kansas, God is actually doing it in other places in the United States as well. There's an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Richmond, Virginia. There's an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Los Angeles. There is an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in um, Joplin, Missouri. And I'm going to try to, uh, I think, show you some photographs here at the end of the Bible study of a massive baptism in the Missouri River there in Joplin in 1901. And, and so it began to spread like wildfire. But here's what happened. The experience outran the theology. And here's what I mean by that. They had this experience but they did not have enough Bible knowledge to back up their experience. And so what happened was you had what they called wildfire. And really the gifts of the spirit without biblical knowledge, and, and the Bible says that the, uh, you know, a prophet has to be subject to the other prophets, his, his voice, his prophecies, uh, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And so anybody ever comes in and tells you and, and says, thus saith the Lord, and I don't care what anybody else says, this is the word of God. Well, that's not, that's not biblical. Uh, the Bible would tell us that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet and the elders of the church have the authority to judge spiritual matters and to decide, yes, this is of God or no, that's not of God. But so, so they had, I don't want to call it chaos, but the gifts of the spirit started operating and they're kind of like gasoline. Now, gasoline in the tank of my Jeep is a wonderful thing. But when you put gasoline on the living room floor and you start playing with matches, all of a sudden it's not such a good thing. And so the experience outran the theology. Now, you may ask the question, well, Pastor Faz, why are, why are you saying that? Well, I'm saying it for this reason. A lot of people have discounted the Pentecostal movement because of how the fire of the Holy Ghost spreads and people respond in a multitude of ways. I've seen people very calmly raise their hands, worship God, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. I've seen other people that when the Holy Ghost gets on them, they go crazy. They're shaking and falling and doing all kinds of stuff that some people think is strange or odd or weird and think, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to have that in my life. And, and so the enemy will use any advantage he can to try to rob people of their faith in the moving of the spirit of the one true God. But I want to tell you tonight that God is real and the Holy Ghost is real. And just like the Holy Ghost started being poured out in the United States 121 years ago, God wants to pour out the Holy Ghost in 2021 in an unprecedented manner. I felt it in prayer and it was confirmed to me by Pastor Garlitz. I felt it in prayer. And I didn't say anything to anybody at all. And I waited for him. Well, I didn't, I waited to see if anybody would say anything to me or if anybody else picked up on it, if anybody else said anything. And a couple of weeks went by, Pastor Garlitz came to me and told me what he felt. And he felt like um, that there would be great moving of the supernatural power of God in our church in the coming days. And so I've been preaching that every service. I've been declaring that our church is gonna see every miracle from the book of Acts. And so I declare it again tonight. Even though I know I have friends, I have colleagues, I have neighbors and citizens in Kaiser, West Virginia, they're going to think I'm crazy for saying it. But you hear your buddy Fazalor today. You hear your colleague Fazalor today. Church, you hear your pastor today. We're going to see every single miracle from the book of the Acts of the Apostles happen in Kaiser, West Virginia. If you believe it, I want you to help me believe it. In Jesus' name, praise God. Now, the, the Holy Ghost continues... It goes to Kansas, it goes to Missouri, it, it goes to Los Angeles, Arkansas, Oklahoma, makes it to Kaiser, West Virginia, old time tent meetings. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that next week. We're going to continue this study talking about church history, and I hope it is a blessing to you. I want to give you a wonderful testimony of something that has happened that is so wonderful. We have been praying ever since um, our prayer meeting we had in September of 2018, we began to pray that the Lord would bless every single human being that drives by the church property, that everybody that drives by would feel the power of the Holy Ghost. 
And we begin to pray, and I know others have joined me in prayer, that the Lord would pour out the Holy Ghost in every single church here in Kaiser, West Virginia. And so I gave you testimony a couple months back before the shutdown that there were three, and I don't want to share names, um, because of the controversy that comes whenever the Holy Ghost begins to be poured out, it shakes up the religious establishment. But there are three different pastors here in Kaiser, West Virginia, that have been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the last year. And I have been teaching Bible studies behind the scenes and talking and encouraging, doing my very best to reach to them as, as much as I can. Um, and, you know, God is doing phenomenal things in people's lives that we don't even know about. God has so much going on, and I'm glad for that. But I got a phone call. I got a phone call on Monday of this week from a pastor, a very, very precious, precious man, precious believer, that told me that the Lord had given him the revelation upon studying the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And he knew that now, in order to follow the word of God, a person must be baptized by immersion in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Well, when he told me that, I about came out of my skin. I was rejoicing. I was so excited because this means so much to us, to, to we apostolics, the apostolic doctrine of repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost are doctrines that are so precious to us. And for someone to receive that revelation from God upon studying the word of God, not, not anybody telling them, not anybody forcing them, God illuminating their understanding. I'm telling you, this is the hour of end time revival. And I want to warn our church, get your eyes off of CNN. Get your eyes off of Fox News. Get your eyes off all that nonsense happening in Washington, D.C. Get your eyes off all the nonsense and the violence and all the stuff that's happening in this world. And get your eyes on Jesus. This is a moment of end time revival. This is a moment when a neighbor might be in need and it might be your prayer that makes the difference. Uh, this is a moment whenever your prayer, your power that's in you by the power of God uh, can influence another soul and God can begin to move. I wanna encourage you to open your eyes and your ears and be sensitive to the voice of God and sensitive to those around you that are in need of a miracle and of a touch from God. Uh, that's the way we're gonna reach this community is only by having the power of God. We must have the power of God. Dead, dry, dull religion is not not going to get the job done. We've got to have the power of God. Hallelujah. Well, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. And I want to say God bless you in Jesus name. And I want you to know how much we appreciate all of our church family. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness during 2020. What a very, very interesting time period it has been for us to live in. But we do appreciate your faithfulness. I want to encourage you to continue to return your tithe and your offering unto the Lord as well as your missions giving is so very, very important. We've not missed a single bill the whole year and that's because of your generosity and kindness. And so I say, God bless you in Jesus name. I'm gonna ask you to pray with me if you would and let us join our hearts together in prayer. Dear Lord, I surely love you tonight. I'm so glad that we have come to the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a privilege to know the word of God, to know that we had to repent and we had to be baptized in Jesus' name and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Thank you for allowing us, Lord, that privilege. We honor you. We love you. And I pray the blessings of God upon this church family. And we thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. And let the church say amen. God bless you in Jesus' name.